Hi, Terry Hay here from Shock Treatment. We've been going to do a lot of videos in order to uh, help you guys set your bikes up, give you a little bit more insight into your motorcycles and how you can get the most out of them. Now, today I'd like to talk to you about setting sag, why we do it. We're actually going to do a, a separate video on, on the setting of sag on, on road bikes and setting of sag on dirt bikes, but today I really we just want to go into the theory and the benefits. Now, if you bought a new motorcycle, um, basically, we want to go out, we want to enjoy ourselves and we want to get the most out of it. If you're buying a race bike, obviously you want to get the highest level of performance that you can. And so everyone is well aware that we set the sag on the motorcycles and most, you know, most people think it's about the springs, you know, making sure we've got the correct springs in the bike for the rider's weight. And certainly that's part of it, but uh, it's actually the direction of force through the vehicle, how that, that force is going to push you and the bike down the track in the most efficient manner. And that all comes down to swing arm angles, there's force angles through the bike, we have chain force angles, a line of force through the swing arm, and we have the force actually at the tyre that's actually pushing the bike. Now, all these forces culminate to produce what we call the instantaneous force centre, and there is a lot of science behind this, but we're going to try and keep it fairly simple so that everyone can tag along, and um, I do realise that there are guys out there that have air hawks and shit on their seat so we're going to keep it slow and easy for you guys you know and you know some of the the crowd that have heated grips and that you know we can't make it too technical so um uh let's get into some of the reasons and we'll get rid of this even though it's a nice looking bike one of the most awesome shop stand ever and we'll bring in the whiteboard now clearly if we're going to start with a bike we're going to design it what we're going to start off with is the motor Okay, and the motor is going to deliver its power through the camshaft sprocket. This is actually uh, a very important thing. And then we're going to suspend it in the frame. And to get our drive, we're going to have a, a swing arm. So a swing arm is running down to the rear wheel. And we have our sprocket. Then outside of the sprocket, of course, we've got the wheel. Now the force coming through the bike is all being delivered along the chain and that's going to give us our, our rotation of the rear wheel to propel us forward and so like I said we have a line of force running through these points a line of force from the, the rear tyre which will act upon the centre of mass of the vehicle and this is all critical. Now getting this swing arm angle right means we're going to get the right amount of push if we don't have our swing arm angle right and it's underneath us, like if someone was pushing me from the ankles, chances are I'm going to want to rotate backwards. And if someone was pushing me from the head, chances are I'm going to want to rotate forwards. But if someone pushed me from the small of my back, they will get the most efficient movement from their effort. Okay, so I'll get propelled forward in the best possible fashion. And that's what we're trying to do with the motorcycle. Now, rear wheel sag is so, so important. If we look at all the forces that's going on here, if we have our front wheel, okay, what's actually happening at the front wheel? Nothing, okay? This thing is just along for the ride. It's just rolling down the track. And so a lot of people say to me, why don't you place so much importance on the front wheel sag? There's no need, okay? What I want to do with the front wheel, I certainly want to set it up, but I would like to get on and ride it. And once I get all the forces directed from the rear, then I want to marry the performance of the front to the rear, and that's when we're going to get the most, the most balanced outcome. Okay, so what we're trying to achieve here, correct swing arm angles, and the best line of push all acting on our center of mass. So we'll try not to get too technical, but I love the science aspect of it. But so anyway, if we've got the combined weight of bike and rider, we want our, our effort to push this down, as I said, as, as efficiently as possible. Now, if we have our force directed too low, what will happen is the bike will want to wheel stand all the time, and that's going to put a lot of weight on the rider's hands, which ultimately, with things like motocross bikes, that can result in a lot of arm pump. You know, you're spending a lot of your effort just hanging onto the bike, it's like water skiing. If we have it directed too high up, what will happen is we can get this stink bug feel. The Americans like to call it stink bug. Um, I've never seen why a stink bug actually looks like that, but I guess there's a reason. 
uh, and it'll jack the back of the bike up. Now, in some situations, that's really, really useful, particularly in low grip situations. Okay, a great example of how angles are really going to help us. If I had to push a car, okay, and I've got that car on the concrete, I've got good grip between my shoes and the concrete, what I would do is I would get down and I'd be able to maintain a, a nice flat angle and basically what that would do is allow me to push the vehicle with minimum effort. Okay, so, so that angle is really going to help me and I'm going to get maximum efficiency from my effort. Now, if, uh, if all of a sudden the surface changed, if I got onto dirt, for instance, if I try to maintain that angle, what would happen is because we're in a low grip situation, my feet would slip out from underneath me and I'd end up falling flat on my face. So in order to change the levels of grip, what I'm going to need is weight. Okay, so I'm now going to direct my force to lifting upward on the vehicle and of course we've got equal and opposite reactions. So as much effort as, as I'm, I'm using to push that vehicle up, that's going to create a downward force on my feet, creating more grip. Okay, so we can do the same thing with our swing arm angles. Uh, in low grip situations, a little bit more angle is really going to benefit, but we don't get maximum propulsion. So there are these trade-offs. Okay. Okay, so we've seen that swing arm angles can play a big part in optimizing our grip. Okay, but they can also play a big part in our comfort levels as well. If we have a downward facing swing arm angle and we hit a bump, the impact is going to move that wheel in two, or it's going to want to move it in two directions. We're going to see a, an upward movement of the wheel but the force of the impact is actually trying to send the wheel backwards as well. Now, while the swing arm is on a downward angle, its initial movement is going to be upward and rearward. But because it travels in an arc, once we get above horizontal, the wheel changes direction and now it's going to be upwards and forwards. And so, if we have a, a swing arm angle that's flat, or our swing arm angle could even be facing upwards a little, which is quite common on Harley Davidson's, What's going to happen is, as we hit that bump now, the movement of the wheel trying to go forwards is actually opposing the force of the impact. So our bump compliance goes out the window. And we'll find that every impact on an upward facing swing arm uh, feels, feels much worse than what it does on a downward facing one. So this angle becomes critical for comfort as well. Right, so now to the spring aspect. Okay, we've spoken all about the angles and obviously We'll have our shock absorber with our spring on it. Now a spring is a, a very, very simple mechanism, okay, and uh, it's, it's basically a, a storage system for energy. As we, as we push down and we compress that spring, we're storing energy in the spring, and that energy uh, is obviously pushing back. So with as much force as I'm compressing it, that spring is pushing back. Once again, equal and opposite reactions. Now, as we increase the tension on the spring, the gap between the gap between the subframe and the swing arm will increase. Okay, so that will push our angle, and this is how we're achieving the angles that we want with spring pressure. So, as we increase the tension on that spring, it will push the back of the bike up, and it will push the swing arm down, and uh, we'll have uh, a lot of downward force if we put a lot of tension on there. As we back the tension off, that gap will compress and our swing arm angle will flatten out. And obviously this gap will change as well. And so when we set a sag, we never, we never shoot for a specific number. What we always do is give a tuning range and that will allow us to achieve the, uh, the resultant angle in the swing arm that's gonna work best for us. Now, if we think of um, uh, the tension that we put on this, this spring, much like uh, tuning a guitar or a piano, Basically, we're going to want enough tension to allow us to hit the right note. If we were tuning a guitar, we had uh, very little tension on it, the note would be very lazy. Uh, we'd tune it until we hit that sweet point, and then if we went beyond that sweet point, everything would become harsh and shrill. And it's just like us with our ride quality. If we put too much preload on a spring, it's going to get harsh and skittish. If we have too little preload, it'll be quite lazy. And when it's lazy, it doesn't push your wheel back down on the ground to give us the grip that we're chasing. So spring selection becomes very, very critical. So a quick little example on springs and what we've got here is just a simple, simple spring drawn here with a 100 kilo weight on it. 
Now, if this was in a completely friction-free and uh, friction-free environment in a vacuum, uh, we could perhaps push that that weight down, and that spring would then compress, and of course, springs store energy, and then they want to release that energy. So that that weight would be moving up and down, and so. it would create a, a, a frequency of oscillation. Okay, now, if we were to put a heavier spring in there, what would happen is that frequency would be a lot faster. And so, now if we were to put a, a, a lighter spring in there, everything would slow down. And even though that's uh, just a rough drawing, I mean, if we had a lighter spring in there, naturally if we push down on that weight, the spring, it would go down further and come up further. And so if we do that on a motorcycle, if we've got too light a spring, what will happen is we'll have an excess of movement. So the wheel will compress a lot, then it will come back, and then it will compress, etc., etc. So that becomes a, uh, a very poor level of control. And if we have too hard a spring, Everything will be, it'll be harsh, it will, uh, it will come back uh, way too quick. And so we don't get the grip levels that we're chasing. And so obviously having the ideal spring with the ideal amount of pressure is what we're seeking. That will give us uh, the swing arm angles that we want. It'll give us the levels of comfort that we want, the grip levels that we're chasing. And obviously uh, when we've got the maximum amount of control, we'll feel the most comfortable on the motorcycle and uh, faster lap times will come. So get all this right, have a look at our next videos where we actually go into the measurements and how you're going to achieve this, but this is basically the uh, thought process behind it and why we're trying to achieve it. And I hope this has given you a greater insight and um, you can enjoy more out of your bikes. Thank you very much. Just a special shout out to my good mate Mark Penning, also known as the Hippie. You're an airhawk wearing Nancy boy. Cheers, mate.